Don't get in the way. You get run over. They were ready for children's church. Kids town. They're ready to go. But you can't go. No, good, no adults unless they're working in there are allowed. <laughs> also, on youth night on Wednesday, if you're not working with the youth, don't show up at church here, okay? We don't need you out there just hanging around like vultures. You, you need to be in your own study. So go, one, go to one of the small groups after you bring your children here, and uh, AJ and the group will do a great job. All right. Crank me up back there, boys and girls. We're going to have a good day today. Going to have a good day. Already been a good day, hasn't it? We've had something every night that the schools have in recent days. It's been every night this week. We've had awards night and graduations, and it's been... <laughs> May is hard on the staff, I'm telling you. And uh, we're all worn out, but it's a wonderful worn out feeling to, uh, to help uh, celebrate what our young people have done. And uh, at Otter Creek uh, the other night, uh, Friday night, they had graduation, and uh, it was so beautiful. And at the end, the kids wanted to sing a song. So they turned the song on, and uh, I have never lately been in anything where spontaneous praise broke out. It was, I started just weeping. It was so beautiful. I said, wow, that's what, hey, the, the Spirit of God's falling on America right now and on young people. And if you're a young person here today, I know that you, you already are experiencing that. I pray that you'll listen to the Lord and, and allow Him to work in your life. Uh, if you get a chance to see Jesus' revolution when they come, please come see that and support that and watch what God did back in the 70s when he poured out his spirit upon the youth. And I really believe he's doing it right now. And you're going to see a lot of young people come to Christ. This year alone in, in this school, just this school, I'm not sure how many we had come to Christ, but a lot. Riverside the same way. Creekside the same way. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing. You know, we, we have three schools that we're you know, either controlled or, or affiliated with and then others that we've helped start. And it's happening, my brothers and sisters. Pastors like myself and spiritual leaders around our nation have, pr have prayed and asked God for, for 50 years now, 40 to 50 years, to do this. And it's happening. And this could be the, this could be the spark. Where's Miss uh, Norma? I saw her out there earlier. Where are you at? Miss Norma said something on that. You said, what would you say in that? You responded to that, didn't you? What, you remember what you wrote? What did you say? Tell them, tell them what you said. Amen. I really believe that she's correct. I believe it's, it's pockets of revival happening. And uh, old people for many years have sung songs about revival. Send a great revival in my soul. They sang it and sang it and sang it. Yet they sat on their behinds. They didn't win souls. They didn't go out and affect their culture. And now look at America. And it's because Christians sat on their dust and they didn't do what God told them to do. So these young people, I don't think you're going to have a problem listening to God and doing what He told them to do. I think you'll see a lot more come to Christ in the, in the coming days. I want to uh, just read a, a small story to you just for a moment to set the pace for the sermon today because I really believe some of you here today are seeking things that are not going to pay off in your life. I think some of you here are seeking things that you think will satisfy you and in the end, you're going to end up really thirsty and dry. And you're not going to be fulfilled in what you're doing in your life. And here's how the story goes. In, in 1869, near the banks of the Tigris River, Russell Cronwell found himself on the back of a camel listening to what seemed like the thousand story told by his Arab guide. An attorney who had once attended Yale, Conwell was getting tired of his guide's vast treasury of stories. But, he later wrote, he was always glad he had listened to this one. His guide told of a man called Ali Hafed who owned a large farm. I imagine he had a camel and a plow to work his land. He labored tirelessly for everything he had day after day. In many ways, 
how Hefed was blessed and he was content. Until that is, he had the pleasure of entertaining a stranger one day. An old priest came to visit, and by Ali Hafed's fireside, he told Ali Hafed about the discovery of diamonds in a distant land. With a handful of diamonds, the priest claimed, one could buy a whole country. With a mine of diamonds, one could place his children upon thrones. That night, as Conwell explained what he had shared, when he shared this story, Ali Hafed went to bed a poor man. He, his contentment had evaporated, unseated by thoughts of diamonds that he did not have. The next day he sought out the priest and begged, Tell me more where I can find diamonds. The priest answered, If you find a river between high mountains that runs through white sands, in those white sands you will always find diamonds. I want a diamond, a mine of diamonds became the cry of Ali Hafed's heart. And that day he determined to chase his dream. He sold his farm. He hugged his wife and kids goodbye, and with a final bold declaration, he said to them, When I come back, we'll be fabulously wealthy. You'll be set for life. Then Ali Hafed went off as a soldier of fortune, hunting for diamonds. He went to East Africa, no diamonds. He went to Palestine, no diamonds. He went to Europe, no diamonds. Finally, after consuming all of his wealth in search of greater fortune, Ali Hafed wandered into Spain, still no diamonds. In Spain, this discontented man reached the point of such despair that he decided to end his life. He stood on a shore, watched a giant wave thunder toward him, and jumped into the raging waters, never to be seen again. One day, the man who bought Ali Hafed's farm was leading his camel to a stream on his new property. It might, I imagine, have been the same camel that Ali Hafed had owned. As the camel drank, a curious flash of light in the stream caught the man's eye. Looking closer, he reached down and pulled out a black stone. He noticed that when the sunlight hit it, the stone lit up with all the colors of the rainbow. The man thought to himself, hmm, pretty stone. Then he walked back to his house, laid the stone on a mantle as a decoration, forgot all about it. The next day, the same priest who had told Ali Hafed about diamonds stopped by. As he was talking to the new owner, the priest paused abruptly in mid-sentence. His eyes had fallen on the black rock sitting on the mantle. Pointing to the stone, the priest exclaimed, That's a diamond! The farmer shook his head, Nothing of the sort, it's just a stone. I'm telling you, the priest said, It's a diamond. Where did you get it? I'll show you. The priest followed the farmer to the garden by the stream. When they stirred up the white sand with their fingers, countless diamonds appeared, bigger and shinier than the first. The man who had bought the farm from Ali Hafed had inadvertently discovered the diamond mines of Golconda, the most magnificent diamond mine in history. In fact, crown jewels worn by royalty all over the world, including Queen Mother in England, come from this, his, very, his very mind, from the same land, the same garden, the same stream, the same camel that Ali had fed, had left behind. Ali had fed, had traveled the world to find what he had all along. He never realized the potential of the place he was. He never realized that he had been living on acres of diamonds. The thought, if I could just go to Africa or Palestine or Europe, or Spain, I will find great worth. All the while, diamonds lay right under his feet. Acres of diamonds. I've got some diamonds with me today, by the way. This is a copy of the world's largest, right, largest diamond ever found. It's not the real one, but it's a copy of it. How big is that? This, I have the international diamond guy with me today. Here's the expert. If you need jewelry or, or diamonds, you, uh, where is it at? Oh, there it is. Replica of the world's largest diamond weight, 3,106 carats. How much are they selling for per carat right now? Are you kidding? That would buy cities. That would buy cities. 
Okay, that's a replica. Now here's a here's another real one. That's how many carats? Three thousand. Now this is a what one carat? This is a real one carat diamond. They make these girls' eyes sparkle. Watch this. Ooh, their eyes. <laughs> when you show that to a lady, their eyes really sparkle. How much would that one cost? About six thousand. Six thousand dollars right there. Oops, I <laughs> wouldn't better not. <laughs> Put it in the pocket and give it to Bonnie later. Ooh. I'm in good hands, just like all say. <laughs> You're in good hands, aren't you? Can you imagine? One carat, six thousand, what thirty one hundred and six carats would be. Figure that up, math man. Mathematician, you got here's a math man here. How much is that? One carat is six thousand. How much? I mean, 13 point? 18. 18.6 million dollars if this were the real thing. One piece of diamond. You know what I really believe? I believe people today, let me give you these back or I might forget to give them to you. Here you go. <laughs> if you need, he said, his, his saying is, if you, if, you, if you don't know diamonds, you better know your jeweler. There's a bunch of fakes out there, so if you want good ones, go see this guy. He'll make sure you get the real, the real deal. We want you to have the real deal, by the way. Listen, people are searching for stuff that they're not going to find. They're, they're looking for things. They're looking for love in all the wrong places, the old country song used to say. They're looking for fulfillment and love and peace, and they're never going to find it unless they find the world's greatest bargain. And the Word of God says it this way. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the and lose Ooh. You could be the richest man in the world. You could own that real diamond and lose your soul. You could be the richest person in Gainesville, lose your own soul. You could be a professor at UF. You could be a Doctor at Shands, you could be the president and lose your own soul. And, and what would it profit if you lost your own soul? Not a thing. Wouldn't be worth anything, would it? Let's start with prayer today as we think about the world's greatest deal. Okay? World's greatest deal. Lord, I thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for the young people that have followed you in baptism. I know there are many, many more that have followed you this year, and I pray for them, Lord, that you will guide them and lead them all the days of their life. Thank you, Lord, for people coming to you as their Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever found a, a good deal? Got a real bargain? I like a real bargain. How many of you like a bargain? Okay. Who, who has gotten a super deal in the last year, you say, that you would say it's a super deal? Real. Anybody? Or are y'all all just getting charred? You're not getting anything. Okay, did you get one? What did you get? Got her engagement ring. Wow, 70%. That's a good deal. You better check with him, see if it's the real deal. <laughs> if you don't know your diamond, you better know your jeweler. I'm saying, he whispers that in my ear all the time. How about y'all? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Okay, over there. They got a brand new one too. That was a great deal. And in fact, I just whispered in his ear a minute ago, if you want to get it, her dedicated, make sure you let us know so we can, wouldn't y'all like to help us dedicate that baby, right? Amen. So anyway, that's what I was talking to him earlier. Okay, back here. I saw one more. Okay. Wow. Hmm. See that little knife? Y'all know I like garage sales and stuff like that, right? I just, and I dig it. And this is why I dig it. The other day I got a, a box that looks like junk. Just a box of junk for about nothing. 
This knife was in there. That's an antique knife. You know how much that knife's worth? How much would you guess? Worth what you want to pay for it. What do you think? 200 More than 200 oh. Sells for 275 on right now. One little piece of junk. That's a, that's a good deal. But it's not near the best deal, is it? Not near the best deal. We, we purchased a painting recently, a beautiful painting. I mean, we've got a super buy on it. In fact, as you're traveling in all your paintings, look for the highwaymen paintings. Do you remember back in the 50s and 60s, the, the black dudes that would sell paintings on the highway for 25 to $30 from the back of their car? You know what they worked out? Thousands. Blackman, and I can't think of the other names, but look look up Highwaymen painting. Worth a lot of money. Right now, land in Florida, <laughs> selling like hotcakes, isn't it? Not a good time to buy land. Why? Too high, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a seller's market, not a buyer's market. People are all, We get a letter every week from some person trying to buy our land. We want to buy your land. They put some ridiculous price. I'm thinking, you don't even know what you're talking about. You ain't going to touch it for that. <laughs> Yet there's some people that might get harder for money might sell for that. There's something available that's far more valuable than land. There's something available a lot more valuable than diamonds or gold. That one diamond, the real deal, is worth how much, you say? $18 million. What could be worth more than that? If I could tell you something worth more than that, would you want to hear about it? Yeah. Would you? How many of you would say, I would like to know something more valuable than that? Would you like to know? Okay, I'm going to share it with you. You ever heard the word grace? God's grace. You've heard it in song after song, and somebody has built this acrostic what the word grace means, God's riches at Christ's expense. Think about that, the grace. God gives you and offers you grace. What does that mean? Think about that for a minute. What does that mean? God offers you grace. Sometimes when we're dealing with children in school, they, they mess up, particularly the athletes. They cannot have a certain amount of detentions or that sort of thing and still play sports. That's pretty good carrot, isn't it? You hold that up there and say, you, if you get the merits and detentions, you can't play. What do you think that does to their behavior? Do you think it helps it or hurts it? It helps it, doesn't it? But once in a while, once in a while, the teacher feels led to give them a, say that word, a grace. And, and that means they get a pass on that particular negative mark the teacher might be giving them. They get this grace. Now, the scripture, I'm going to take you to for a minute, where this is used and in a beautiful way to show you how God and what God wants to do for you, found in Genesis. And it, the earth had gotten so bad that God decided to, to destroy it. Genesis chapter 6 said, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Think about that for a minute. Now, why would God want to destroy the animals too? So I want to destroy man because he is so bad. And you read another place, the violence fill the land. Why would he want to kill the animals too? Well, if you know humans, they always involve animals in their sins. They not only corrupt each other, they corrupt the animals. And, and the world was just filled with corruption and, and violence. And God said, I'm going to destroy it. And here's what I like. I love this scripture. It said, but, read it with me, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do it again. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He said, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And you remember the rest of the story. He told Noah to do what? Build a boat. Build an ark. Noah probably said, what's an ark? He said, getting ready to rain. I'm going to rain on earth. He goes, what's rain? <laughs> what are you talking about? And the Lord said, you just do what I tell you. Build the ark. And he gave him the instructions. Of course, he did. And later, we read that he 
he saved his family. Could have saved a lot more people. Only saved the, the, the eight souls that got on board with him. Could have saved hundreds, maybe thousands even. We don't know how much it would have hold, but, held, but only the eight that got on board were saved. But, and it happened because Noah found... Noah found... Grace. Say that word. Noah found grace. grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see... When, when the Lord offers you forgiveness and pardon, and just think about this. All human beings tend to go against what God says. How many of you say, I have broken at least one of the Ten Commandments? Hold your hand up. Keep it up. Okay, now put it back down. How many of you say, I've broken at least two? How many of you say, I've broken at least three? How many of you say, I've broken at least four? We all have. That's why the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you really know how much it takes to convict you in God's court of law? Do you know how much it takes to convict you, totally convict you of, of breaking all of the law? How many do you think you have to break? One shot deal. But. Blank found, put your name in that spot, but Bill found grace. You see, if you don't find grace, if you don't get grace and apply it to your life, you don't let the Lord forgive you, you won't have a snowball's chance in Hades to get to heaven. You're, you're lost and you're undone. You will not go to heaven, period. People say, "Well, I'm going to do good. I'm a good person, and I keep, you know, I do this, and I don't cheat on my taxes, and I don't cheat on my wife, and I give to the poor, and I'm a pretty good person." Listen, you're not good enough. Okay, in order to get to heaven by being a good boy or good girl, you have to be 100% perfect all the time. You have to bat 1,000. Did you know most major league baseball players? What's what do you think their average is? Their adding average batting average for the pros. What do you think it is? Three or four hundred, right? You know what that means? <laughs> that means 50 to 60% of the time they strike out. They don't even get a hit. They only get a hit and get on base 30 to 40% of the time maximum. That's the best. Listen, you have to bat 1,000 in order to get, get there by being good enough. You have to have God's grace. That, great, that G word. See, I hope that you'll find God's grace today. I hope if you, don't, you haven't found it and you haven't applied it in your life, you will. Listen, it's, it's not too late. The time is now. God has brought you here today for you to hear this message about the world's greatest deal. The world's greatest deal is God's offer of grace to people like us. And, and the, the Word of God says that Christ gave us His riches for our poverty. 2 Corinthians 8 9, For we, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich Jesus didn't have to come for you and me he wanted to but he didn't have to he did that of his own accord he said this he said I lay my life down people say well the Romans killed him and the Jews no no Jesus said I lay my life down for my sheep see it was his choice to do that he left his royal robe in heaven. He left all the riches there, came and lived a, a poor life on the earth as a carpenter's son, allowed the world to kill him, and he did it because he loved you. He wanted to extend. That's a good word, isn't it? Aren't you glad for, for grace? Isn't, really, the world's the greatest deal. Grace, it's a wonderful deal. Christ, the second thing, gave us his joy for our sorrow. I don't know if you've experienced sorrow recently. We have. It hurts. It still hurts. But you know what? I've got joy as well. We gave away our, a scholarship. We do it every year to the different schools in the honor of our daughter, 40-year-old daughter that suddenly went to heaven in 2020. You know, and it hurts so bad when you think about it. But you know what? I still have great joy because I know where she's at. And I know I get to see her one day. But, but see, we have sorrow here. John 16, 20 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, and the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. 
Yeah, we have hard times. Christians have hard times. Listen, people think become a Christian, you never have any problems. You, you always have a full checkbook and your kids never get sick and, and your dog never gets run over and you know everything's just perfect. No, it's not perfect. We live in an imperfect world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where there's all kind of problems and there is sorrow. There is grief at times, but he says this, your sorrow shall be turned into joy. If you've lost a loved one in recent years, you understand this. We have. We lost our daughter. and My brother, you lost your daddy, and your, you lost her husband, and others have lost their husbands. You know, one of my dear friends, he was like one of my best friends of the past. You know, He's in heaven now. My daughter's in heaven now. My daddy-in-law is in heaven now. My grandmas are all gone. But you know what? <laughs> I miss them and I shed tears sometimes. I have natural good sorrow for them. But I'm not sorrowful as if I've lost them. Because I haven't. I know that he gives me joy because I'm going to see them again. They had grace on their life. They knew Jesus. They had received the grace of God. And, and I know I will see them again. Second Corinthians 7, 10, for Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, people that don't have Jesus, they don't have any joy. They can't get any joy. I preach so many funerals, and sometimes I preach funerals of, of people that don't know Christ. Those are hard ones to preach. What do you say? You know, I'm, I'm careful not to just say, oh, your, your person died and they're lost, they're in hell. I don't tell them that. I just say you need to seek God and let him give you comfort because God... He calls himself the God of all comfort. And he says he's near to those of a broken heart. So I know that even though their loved one may be lost, they can still get grace from God and, and get peace through that time, even though it's hard to, it's a pastor, it's hard to preach those things, to, you know, those kind of funerals. Totally different, preaching the funeral of a, a saved person. Because many, many times it ends up being a, a celebration of life, a celebration of rejoicing, knowing that we're going to see them again, and we're going to we're going to we're going to see them, our loved ones again. I can't wait to get there. By the way, it's going to be the greatest reunion I've ever been to. Yeah, because you know why? All my loved ones that I'm kin to that were saved are already there. More of them that are alive right now, and all of the Christians that knew us in the past that are were adults and taught us in Sunday school and and prayed for us and mentored us. They're all, they're all there. So when I get there. There's a big family reunion going to happen. It's not going to be just old oh, floating around on clouds and playing harp. Vroom, vroom, vroom. No, it's a family reunion, and, and the Lord talks about the great supper going to come, great meal coming. Listen, we want you to have the world's greatest deal. We want you to take advantage of the world's greatest deal, and that greatest deal is the grace of God. It's the third thing, Christ gave us peace for our trouble. I know this. <laughs> If it hadn't been for God's peace, I couldn't have stood it when, when Elizabeth passed. It was crushing to know three, two or three different times we had made the run from Gulf Hammock to the hospital in Crystal River, and three different times God had delivered her from close to death on different things that had happened in her life. And this fourth time, I expected him to do the same. I, on the way, I said... God's going to come through. He always has. He always will. And, and, and we're, she's going to be okay. And we got there. And the mother-in-law on the other side walked up. Shake it. She said, she didn't make it. <laughs> she didn't make it, Bill. And we, both of us just collapsed. We collapsed. And we're both sobbing and hurting, you know. It, it hurt bad. But, you know, in all that time, God gave us peace unlike we've ever had before. He came through, didn't he, Miss Vonnie? Do we miss her? Oh, yeah, every day. Do we have tears sometimes? Oh, yes, <laughs> weekly and monthly many times. But you know what? I got peace about it. God gave me his peace, and in our trouble, the peace came just like he promised. Jesus said it this way, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, and give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, a lot of people have to get the bottle or pills to get that peace, okay? Here, drink this, take this, and they mask the pain by some sort of substance. We didn't use any substance other than God's Holy Spirit coming and giving us His peace. And You know, you know who the first friends that came to my door were? 
I'll never, ever forget this. And I owe them all for the rest of my life. And that's James and Debbie Lofton were the first people to my door. And we were, we were in terrible agony over our daughter. And, and our Christian friends came and loved on us. <laughs> you know, and the peace of God came and loved on us. And then other friends started showing up and other friends started calling. And I tell you what. This, you've experienced it recently, haven't you, Paulette? And, and all of you that have been through it know what I'm talking about. We have been there. We got the T-shirt. <laughs> and I can promise you, God will bring his peace. Just like he did for us, he'll do it for you. Fourth thing, Christ gave us his love for our hatred. His love for our hatred. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I used to have a real problem of, of hatred in my heart. At one time I was a pretty prejudiced young man and I had some hatred toward people of other color because I, as a young child I'd been beat up and it made me so angry and I had that hatred in my heart for that particular race for no reason other than the fact that I'd been beat up and nothing had been done about it. But you know what? When, when God got a hold of my life and Jesus changed my heart he gave me a, a not. A, he took the hatred away. I can honestly say that hatred is gone, you know. And that was one of the first things I noticed that my hatred left. You see, greater love hath no man than lay than this. He, man lay down his life for his friends. But this cometh, John fifteen twenty five. This cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law that hated me without a cause. Listen, when Jesus laid down his life for me, died for me, paid for my sins. And he, and he talks in the Bible about forgiveness. He said, if, if you won't forgive your brother, I won't forgive you. You ever read that? You know, and, and he started kind of massaging my heart with that and saying, hey, I gave my life for you. I died for you. I died for those sins. You can let them go now. And I was able to let it go because the hatred went away and the love for people came into my heart. And I, and I started wanting to tell them about Jesus rather than hating them. <laughs> I started loving on them rather than hating them. And I, I thought, this is weird. This has never happened before, and I knew it wasn't something that I worked up. It wasn't something I just dreamed up. Something happened from the inside out that God had done. It was because of his word and what he had done. Fifth thing, Christ gave us his righteousness for our rags. One scripture says that, his, that our, ra our righteousness to him are like filthy rags. Isaiah, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as... Filthy rags. In the, in, the, in the Hebrew, filthy bandages. You ever seen a, a nasty bandage that you just throw away? You don't do anything with that bandage except do... They, they have, in fact, hospitals these days, what do they do with nasty bandages? They put them somewhere where other... Well, some kind of a red thing they put them in, don't they? Sharps and that sort of thing. They put them where people can't get affected by, infected by them and... He says, when I see you, your righteousness, that's what it looks like to me. Dirty stuff that's been on a bandage that's been on one of your swords. As good as you think you are, God sees your, your goodness as that. He says, we all do as fate is a leaf and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. See, human saints are so hot, hot and high and mighty and they're so good. No, we're not high and mighty and so good. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You can't even know how bad you are and what you could do. I always hear people say, well, why? You, believe it, every time you see the news, a person shoots up a bunch of people, what do they immediately say? What do they say? Mental problem. He's, that guy's got mental. He must be sick. He's mentally sick. Oh, he's psychologically, no, he's a sinner that didn't control himself. He's a sinner that allowed his sins to get out of control. He didn't do it because he's a nut or a crazy person. He did it because he's a sinner. He's got a wicked heart. And he hated people rather than loving them. And he did those stupid things and bad things and evil things because of his wicked heart. But see, Isaiah said it pretty good, didn't it? And, and the Lord takes away, look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he had made him to be sin for us. Who's him? Jesus who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Hmm, that's pretty good, isn't it? We get His righteousness. Now think about that for a minute. One scripture says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Think about this. Here I am, 
all my filthiness. Here Jesus is with all his goodness. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And God laid on him the sin of us all. It, he took it. He paid for it. I should pay for it, but I don't have to. You know, I mean, I should go to hell, but I don't have to because I've got the righteousness of Christ covering my life, over my life. Well, that's kind of a, an illustration of, of what happened at the Passover. You, you studied the Passover? Anybody remember what the Passover? Why did they call it the Passover? What was that all about? Passover what? Passover Gainesville? or No. They killed the lamb, and what did they do with the blood? Put it over the doorpost. He said, get your family inside the house. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And you know, even Egyptians, if they had painted the doors with the blood and gotten in the house, they'd have been safe. But only the ones that got under the blood were safe. Only those that get under the, the grace of God, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, only those that receive the, the greatest deal ever given to humans, only those are going to get in and, and, and God's judgment will pass over you. He won't punish you like He will the rest of the people in the world. And it's because the blood has been applied to your life, the, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sixth thing, Christ gave us life for death. Life for death. Think about this now. Romans 5.15 But not as, uh, as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the... Uh, there it is again, the grace word. My soul. Underline grace when you're reading your Bible. It's, it's all through it. Much more the grace of God and the gift by Grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Now think about that for a minute. He gives anybody that wants it the, the greatest deal of all time, the greatest deal in history. He gives it to them because he wants to. He gives, us, he gives us his grace. He said, Jesus has abounded unto many. The grace of God is enough to save the entire world if they would just let him. If they would just let him and they would receive that gift. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us with Christ. By grace are you saved, and you know the rest of that, 9 and 10, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it's all by, say it, it's all by, don't be afraid of that word, that's a cool word, that's a good word. Christ gave us glory for our shame. He gave us life for death. We don't have to go to hell unless we want to. Did you realize that? You don't have to go to hell unless you want to? <laughs> now, if you want to, you're dumb. Don't go. You're stupid. I can say that to you in a, in a nice, polite way. Don't be dumb. Don't go to hell. Don't have to unless you want to. But also, Christ gave glory for our shame. John 17, 22, And the glory which I gave us me, Jesus is praying... In fact, if you read John 17, it is the Lord's Prayer. That whole chapter is God, Jesus praying to the Father. It's cool, a cool chapter. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. You heard that, right? We call that what? It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer, this is the front part of it. He said, In the glory which thou gave us me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. He gives us His glory for our shame. We become one with God we also become one with one another. Did you know we're brothers and sisters? Yeah, it don't matter what race you are, or what religion, or whatever. When we come to Christ, we become one with the Father. And we also become one with one another. Those little, those little girls and the young man that got baptized today, they asked Christ in their life a while back. Today they were just showing you that they followed him. And you know, they're one in Christ with, with, and one with Jesus now and one with the Father, but also they're one with us. They're, they're brothers and sisters to us. Psalms 113.7 He hath raised up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, <laughs> even with the princes of his people. Did you realize you are now royalty? Yeah. When you receive God's grace and you come into his family, you are royalty. 
You're one of the very children of God upon this earth. And you will sit with, with him one day when he, when he comes back and sets up his kingdom. You're part of his family. I know this. I love y'all, but I love my grandkids a lot more than I love you. How many of you love your grandkids more than you love me? How many of you love your children more than you love me? You better. Not a good parent if you don't, you know. Man, I love my kids. But when them grandkids want something, hey, grandbuddy's going to move heaven and hell to get it for them if I can. You know what, they, when, they, when I come up to the ball field, you know what my youngest, next to the youngest, he runs up to me. He goes, he goes the bank is here. <laughs> he knows. He knows if granddaddy's going to keep a, an extra 10 or 20 or so in his pocket because Wiley and those, bunch, those boys are going to eat some food at the ball of a game. I remember as a little kid, and we were, we were poor as dirt, dirt mice, I'm telling you. And it was so terrible to be at a ball game or at a fair and only have a buck or 50 cent in your pocket. You didn't have enough to get anything, you know. Didn't have enough to ride the ride. I said, when I get grown, I'm, I'm not going to experience that, and my kids ain't going to experience that. And I'm thankful that God has blessed us in that way. And God has blessed you even more because the greatest deal on earth is you coming to know the Savior. God has so much more for you that you're not experiencing it's not just joining a church and getting baptized and, and putting your name on a roll somewhere. Listen, we're talking about the greatest deal on earth is that you become a very family member of God, the God of heaven. He wants you to be. He wants you to be part of that. And one day, it says, they may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. I was thinking about that a couple of days ago, and I don't know where I was reading. Maybe it was in the, Our Daily Bread, but do you remember when, maybe, well, I don't know, maybe it was this morning, reading about Joseph and his daddy made the coat of many colors and his brother started hating him, right? Sold him into slavery and he, he was a slave down there in Egypt, taken into Potiphar's house, got thrown in prison. A lot of bad stuff. End of the story is he got promoted into second in command to Pharaoh. That was a pretty powerful position. That's like being vice president, except even more powerful because... The leaders in those days had the power of life and death. They told him, told him somebody cut your throat, cut his throat. He looked at me wrong. You're done. You know that's powerful and not a good power, but it's powerful. And here's this guy, this poor kid from Palestine or Israel, ends up being second in command in Egypt. Listen, wait till wait till we hadn't seen yet what that all means about us sitting with the princes. I know this, girls. When you come to Christ, you're not only his little daughter, you're one of his little princesses. Don't you dare sell your diamond field out for a few minutes of pleasure or some boy lying to you and telling he loves you and all that stuff. Listen, you keep yourself pure and holy before the Lord. Guys, the same way. I believe it goes both ways. Guys, don't sell your soul for a moment's pleasure. Don't sell your soul for a little bit of alcohol or drugs or free sex if there is such a thing don't do it because you are if you know him and you become one of his you're a very child of God not only a child of God if you're a, a boy you're a prince with Jesus and girls you're princesses <laughs> you know you belong to the most high God and I would say don't sell yourself out for something lower than what God would have for you question and the end of our sermon today. Will you take advantage of the world's greatest deal? If someone were to offer you, let me borrow your big dime in a minute. If somebody were to offer you the real deal, said you can have it free, who would take it? You wouldn't take it? If it was real, how many? million? You, Hey, I promise you, you, I'd be first in line. I'd take it. Somebody wanted to give it to me free. If you didn't, there's something wrong with your brain. Go back and check your brain. See if you turned it on this morning. Listen, grace of God is much more valuable than the biggest diamond in the world worth 13 billion or whatever it's worth. And all God wants from you just to, just to accept him as your Lord, that's all. It don't, it don't cost you a thing other than maybe a few minutes 
standing in front of somebody saying, hey, I trusted you, like little kids did today. They went up there and in front of you said, I'm so-and-so and I trusted you. But you know what? The, the price was paid 2,000 years ago. The price was paid for them 2,000 years ago. On the, on the cross at Calvary, the Lord paid their, paid their way into heaven, paid for all their sins, and they have a ticket punch now. Free trip. One-way trip to heaven one day. Free trip. And all God wants from you is, is do, you, do you want that? That's the question. That's what this is all about. It's helping you come to that point where you'll say, count me in, Lord. <laughs> count me in. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And give you a chance to meditate for a moment and think. Think about what we just said. Think about the greatest deal of the world and greatest deal of history is when God sent His own Son to purchase a place in heaven for you. Most of you here probably have already received that free gift that He's offered. Some of you might not have. When the God of heaven does everything He did to get His Son here to die for your sins, pay your penalty... Who are you to say, who are you to thumb your nose up at the God of heaven and say, I'm not going to do anything about that. I'm not going to follow you, Lord. If you're that person, I feel real sorry for you. If you're that person that will not bow the knee to the God of heaven and accept his son, I feel real, real sorry for you. Don't be that person. Be the, be the one that, like these young people that have followed Christ, say, no, I want that. I want forgiveness of my sin. I want heaven when I die. If you're here today and, and God has spoken to you, this, this sermon is not aimed at anybody. It's just trying to tell everybody here the best deal of the whole world of history. But if you're here today and you'd, like, you'd say, I want to be a part of that. I want to go to heaven when I die. And I don't know that yet, but I would sure like to. Would you, would you talk to me, Pastor, how to do that? Just quietly put your hand up, put it right back down. Put it up, put it right back down. Anybody like that? Okay, didn't see any hands, but that's okay. Only the Lord knows people's hearts. Now, if you would say this, Pastor, I'm, I don't know a lot about it, and I'm, I'm trying to walk with him, and I'm struggling a little bit right now. Would you pray for me? in my walk with God that I'll really start trying to please Him with my life and I would just like a, a boost from the from the Lord. Would you put your hand up? Put it up. Say, I just, I'm, I'm battling a little bit and need some help. Amen. 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 Nothing wrong with battling. <laughs> That's part of the world, isn't it? We have to battle our flesh and the world and the devil a lot of times. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, you saw the hands and Lord, I didn't see anyone that... Uh, acknowledge that they want to follow you today, but that doesn't mean that there might not be a soul here today that hasn't come across yet. I pray that if there is that one that has not come across to you yet, I pray they will soon while there's time. Lord, there was a few hands raised about needing a boost from you to help them, Lord, as they're struggling in their walk with you. And, and Lord, you, you struggled here too because the Scripture says that in Hebrews that you learned obedience through the things you suffered meaning you went through all the stuff we went. In fact, one scripture says you were tempted like we are in every area. And so I pray for, for these that raise their hands that you'll give them strength, help them to overcome these temptations they're battling and start walking in victory every single day. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will avail and accept the grace that you offer us, just like you offered Noah long ago. Noah found grace in your eyes and Lord I pray that there are someone here today will find grace in your eyes before they leave here today in the name of Jesus I pray and all God's people said amen. amen thank you Mr. John for providing the diamonds today we appreciate that very much if you don't know your diamonds you better know your jeweler see ya Wednesday. oh I know one, one announcement uh, if you're doing a small group we, I've chosen this year for the summer studies the chosen and you can either stream it from your smart TV or I have copies of season one in the office. Miss Carol, are you back there?
can't see if you are. We'll have them in Ms. Carroll's office with an outline of questions that you can use for discussion. But that will start this coming Wednesday. So you can pick that up or stream it from your devices. So God bless. See you.